There we go. Just about this time, or about the time of Lent around last year, I taught a Christian Ed series on spiritual disciplines, like prayer and fasting and all that kind of thing. And um, during that time, I studied, or I read at least, some parts of books um, about prayer and different methods of prayer. And I learned many good and helpful things that I, I sometimes apply and I uh, pass on uh, when I can. At the same time, I came away from that particular study feeling like a really bad Christian, a really pathetic Christian. Um, I, I was reading books authored by guys and, and women too who seemed to just like float on this spiritual cloud of, of just this constant interaction and knowledge of God's will and purpose in their life. And, and they were always, it was the sense that these, these guys were always in communion conscious communion with God. And when I looked at my own prayer life, um, I realized that I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not there. I don't, I don't feel like that um, very often. So I came away kind of feeling like, again, a pathetic, a pathetic Christian. And, and then, it, you know, sometimes, I don't know if you've had this experience as well, but it's the, the same thing or the same feeling I get sometimes when I go to prayer meetings, especially prayer meetings with other pastors there. And um, we'll be praying, and I don't know if you've ever been with me in a prayer meeting, but I'm, again, I'm pretty pathetic at, at, these, at these kinds of things. I don't do very well. It's just not my, my gifting. But I always come away feeling really bad because there are some guys there who just, it seems like they just have these ongoing, open conversations with God all the time. And God speaks to them very clearly. He tells them what he wants them to do, and they, and they do it. And he, they talk back, and they have this conversation going on. Um, sometimes while we're there in this prayer group and they're praying, and I, I don't have that. I just don't. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not there. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm very disciplined. I have this inner drill sergeant. I don't know. I've always had this inner drill sergeant. So um, about 4 o'clock in the morning, he says, wake up, and I, and I get up, and I'm there. And, I'm, I, and so I pray. I pray, I pray regularly. I do have a, a regular um, prayer life. Um, and I can see, if I, if I look at the way God has worked in my life, and the way God has worked in this church, and the way God has worked in uh, my family, I can definitely see that God has used my prayer in my life to change me, and to change the circumstances around me, and to change the people um, around me. I can see that very clearly. And in fact, if you have your Bible open to Colossians chapter 4, um, verses 3 and 4. If you don't have it open open now, you'll see there where Paul asks the Colossians to pray for him. He asks that they pray that God will open a door for him to preach the word and that God will help him to preach clearly when he does. Um, you'll see that, that Paul and scripture in, in general assumes that God uses the prayer of his people to change circumstances, to open hearts, and to help people use their gifts in the spread of the gospel. It's all right there. It's the assumption under the prayer request that Paul gives to the Colossians. God uses my prayers and he uses yours to change the world, to move hearts and to change us as individuals. So it's not that I find prayer ineffective. It's just that I find it very hard. I find it hard to concentrate. I find it hard to feel like anything is actually happening while I'm praying. I rarely feel a strong connection to God in prayer. Now, some of you might, and if you do, wonderful. I'm talking to the others who often don't. I know that God hears every thought before I think it. Psalm 139, 2. I know that God knows my every need before I even need it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 32. 
I know that God knows every word that is going to come out of my lips before it's even on my lips. Psalm 139, verse 4. And I know that um, I know that the Spirit helps me in my weakness and that when I do not know how to pray or what to pray for, that the Spirit intercedes for me with groanings too deep for words. And I know that he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit who dwells in me and that the Spirit intercedes for followers of Jesus according to the will of God, Romans 8, verses 26 through 27. I know that. All of these truths are true. I've seen miracles. I've seen God use prayers to open doors where there wasn't even a door to open. But I don't regularly come away from prayer with a sense that I've been in real communion with God. And because of that, it's easy for me to get discouraged. And so I often enter into prayer without a real expectation that God is there and active and moving in my life. There is, in other words, often a sense of futility in my prayers. Now, this is not personal confession time. I don't think that I'm alone. I mean, I have, like I said, I've been to prayer meetings and I've read books and I've, I've been in churches where you know, the assumption is everyone's having this deep, deep, rich, spiritual walk with God and always living a life of prayer. And you know what? Half the time, I think that's a big lie. Because I think a lot of the time, our experience of God in prayer can be that we don't experience him. It can be futile. The New Testament, the reason I know I'm not alone, is the New Testament anticipates that frustration. In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, the judge refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll give her justice so they shall not beat me down by her continual coming. Luke chapter 18, verses 2 through 5. What's Jesus' point in that parable? We're told his point explicitly in verse 1, which I didn't read. Let me read it to you now. Jesus told this parable to the effect that they, meaning his disciples, ought always to pray and not lose heart. See, Jesus knows you, and Jesus knows me. He knows that we're weak. He knows that we're easily discouraged. And so he says, and this is sometimes I find unhelpful, but he says it, he says, don't quit. Don't, and this is the key we're going to be moving toward, don't let your emotions rule your prayer life. Don't let your feelings determine your prayer life. Don't lose heart. Don't stop praying. Pray and keep praying and don't stop. Now, how different, by the way, is God as a parent of us than I and maybe Ann too, if she's around, are our parents to our children, right? Because uh, of all of our children, probably Aiden is the most incessant, like when he wants something. He is on our back. Every uh, He wants a popsicle or he wants a what, pancake or whatever. He is on our back. He's on my back. Give me, can I have this? 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 And finally, I want to destroy him. I, want, I, I love my son, but I want to destroy him at, at, at a certain point. Right? I, I want him to be quiet. Ask me once, not again. That's the way I am. But see, it's so interesting because God is the opposite of that. God says, no, no, keep asking, keep coming to me, keep praying, nag me to death. But he can't die, so that's why he can can take it. You can keep coming to him with these things. Don't stop. I am not, God says, the unjust judge. I hear you. I'll act on your behalf. 
I'll do what is good for you. If you ask me for bread, I won't give you a snake. Know that even when you can't feel it. So in the place, so to remedy, this is, where, this is where the Bible is sometimes frustrating. To remedy our sometimes sense of futility and frustration in prayer, our lack of a feeling of experience of God's presence, Jesus just says, just keep doing it. Keep praying. Don't lose heart. Keep praying. Keep it up. And so to the Colossian church, Paul writes this, and you see it there in verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Now that phrase you see, continue steadfastly, uh, means in Greek, um, continue steadfastly. It's in the imperative. That means it's a command. Pray. And keep praying. So why is this command necessary? And more importantly, why is it hard to keep? Now, many people, myself included, I do this, associate the presence and the power of God with a movement of the heart. So this is why, this is why in some, not this is church so much, but this is why church hopping sometimes happens, right? Because people go to a place and they feel the presence of the Spirit. I feel the Spirit here, right? And they'll stay, and then one Sunday they don't feel the Spirit there, and then another Sunday they don't feel the Spirit there, and then another Sunday they don't feel the Spirit there, and then they go somewhere else looking to the, find the place where they can feel the Spirit, Okay, so what does Jesus say about his presence in the church? When is Jesus here? When two or more are gathered, right? So if you don't feel the presence of the Spirit, whose fault is that? What does that mean? That's just your feelings, right? Because the Spirit is here. Right? That he's promised to be here when two or more are gathered. He is here. If you don't feel it, that's your problem. That's not God's problem. So when I'm, anyway, back to my point, when I'm moved by worship, when I'm on a spiritual mountaintop, I say to myself, God's here, God's present. This prayer, this prayer time has been beautiful and wonderful. I feel it. But since that experience is rare and fleeting and not daily, you and I and many people can begin to experience prayer as a lonely exercise of the will rather than a true communion with God. It's just like this thing we just have to keep doing. So the problem is that we associate God's presence with our experience of God's presence. And when we do that, we look in the wrong direction. I'm going to give you a, 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 a biblical truth that I hope will help you here and in the future in your prayer life and in your worship life, and just your spiritual life in general. The Bible most plainly and clearly associates the movement of God's Holy Spirit in your life and in the life of the church primarily with the decisions that you make. A decision, for example, to be obedient in an area of your life which in which your emotions and passions are drawing you in the opposite direction, is a spirit-filled decision. A decision, for example, to forgive when every fiber in your being is screaming out for vengeance is a spirit-filled decision. A decision God's spirit has moved you to. Right, you, you see that? So, so, so often the strongest, most tangible evidence of the Spirit of God being present with you is when you're doing something you don't feel like doing. Or when you're doing something, it seems like you're just obeying a law when 
There's no feeling to it. Often that is the most tangible evidence of God's power working in you and moving you in the direction he wants you to go. Now, one example. How do I know that? I'll give you one example. They're all over the place. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13, um, verse, I think, 21, and we'll see this. The author of Hebrews, and we don't know who it is, but the author of Hebrews prays this for his readers. May the God of peace, listen carefully, may the God of peace equip you with everything good that or so that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Okay, here's what this means. That prayer, and again, there are many like it, dotted throughout Scripture, assumes that doing what God wants you to do because he wants you to do it is God's working in you. It assumes that obedience is the indication of the presence and the power of of the Holy Spirit, because the prayer says, will you equip me with everything good so that I might do his will, or that you might do his will. He works in us so that we might do what is pleasing in his sight. That is God's Spirit working. So let me show you how this all plays back out in prayer. So you're sitting there tomorrow morning, which I'm sure you're all going to pray tomorrow morning because the sermon's on prayer today, so you're gonna, if, you, if you've lapsed away from your prayer habit, tomorrow morning you're going to get up bright and early, or maybe tomorrow afternoon, you're going to say, I'm going to pray, I'm going to do it, right? So you're sitting there, and you're praying, and um, even if you don't feel like it, feel it, and even if you don't feel like you're communicating with God at all, so you're, you're laboring at it, and you're feeling condemned because you're laboring at it, and you're feeling alienated from God because you don't feel anything, um, your labor there is one of the clearest and tangible evidences of God's power in your life. You there committing to pray every day, even when the feeling's not there, that itself is God's spirit and power working in you. All right, so you're wondering, where is God? He's right there, or you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. Does that make sense? You are, your action in obedience to God's call to prayer is itself the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit giving you strength and power, um, and he's showing himself to you in the very act. A decision then, no matter how difficult on your part to be steadfast in prayer, even when you feel nothing, is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. God is, at that moment, changing your mind and moving your will and conforming to you to his Son. The call to pray steadfastly, day after day, is, like so much of the Christian life, a call to work out your salvation with fear and and trembling, because God works in you to will and to do according to his will and good pleasure. That's what that is. So, how many here um, have a daily habit of prayer? Good. Good. How many here have ever felt a sense of futility, or like you're not really getting anything out of your daily habit of prayer, right? Fine. Good, you're doing it. I think a lot of people who raise their hand the first time raise their hand the second time. That's good. That means you are in Christ. He's giving you his spirit to do these things. That's an evidence and a clear sign of his power working in you. Wonderful. Now, uh, look down. If you are in Philippians, or if you're in Hebrews, turn back to Colossians um, 4. And we'll see that to this call to steadfastness, to regular attending to prayer, um, we don't have time to talk about prayer methods or anything else. We'll just say, he says, do it. Um, to this, Paul says, be watchful in prayer. Now, that word could also be translated alert. If you have an NIV Bible, it may be translated alert there. Peter uses the same word, and it'll give us a hint as to its meaning to a Greek person. Um, uses the same word in 1 Peter 5, 8, when he says this, um, 
Be watchful for the devil who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Same word. Watchful. And it always is used, or it's usually used in the context of being tuned in to threats. Being tuned in to danger. To be watchful in prayer is, I think, then, I think what Paul means here is to be tuned in to challenges, obstacles, threats to the spread of the gospel in you and in the world. That follows along with his request in verses 3 and 4 to pray for him. Threats in our life come, in our Christian life, come from the flesh. That's your own sinful nature, your own desires that draw you away from God. They come from the temptations that are in the world. And they come from the devil, Satan, and his demons. Three places. They work together. Satan is real and he hates you. Satan is real and he hates you. He hates your family. He hates this church. He wants to pull us down and destroy us. He wants you to stay home on Sunday morning. He wants you to stay home for Bible study. He wants you to complain. He wants you to gossip. He wants you to lust. He wants you to be unforgiving. He wants you to despair, and he uses the world around you and your own flesh, your own weaknesses and passions, to bring these desires of his to fruition. It works all together. Let me give you an example of what Satan does. How many here like to gossip? Okay, yeah, there are some honest people. The 8 o'clock service, they're all, oh, no one here likes to gossip, and it was a big lie. Of course, we all like gossip. When you get good, a uh, good juicy bit of information, you just want to pass it on. That's human nature. Some of us have a real problem with gossip. Others, we just only do it sometimes. But gossip is one of those things that can really not only tear you apart, but tear apart of relationships in the church, can't it? Right? So let's just say um, you have an issue of gossip. Um, you love to get some tasty information and pass it on. Our enemies will do all they can to set as much, and by enemies I mean spiritual enemies, demons, Satan, to set as much sweet, savory knowledge about other people in his ears and your ears as he possibly can. Like if your issue is gossip, you're gonna, Satan's going to do all he can to get as much fodder for you to gossip about into your ears as possible. Now, if you are not watchful, if you don't know that about yourself, if you've never taken the time to examine your own soul, your own heart, your own desires, your own passions, and you don't know you're a gossip, that's one reason the church is here, to help tell you if you're a gossip, be quiet. But um, if you don't know you're a gossip, if you're not watchful over yourself, then you'll swallow the lure and be hooked every time. How many here love to share the gospel with people who are not Christians? No one raised their hand, my goodness. Very honest bunch of people today. I'm very um, happy with that. Um, Satan hates the gospel. He hates it when someone believes in Jesus Christ and is, is transferred from darkness to light. He hates that. He hates it when individuals and congregations act on the mission Jesus gave to his church. So he does everything in his power to encourage you and to encourage me and to encourage us as a body not to do it. He uses resentments to divide us. He uses a love of comfort and a fear of risk to hobble us. We can't spend money that way. We can't do this. We can't do that. He uses our individual sin issues to impede and impair and infect other people in the church body and make the entire body weak and inactive. Don't think that your struggle with dishonesty 
or your struggle with lust or your struggle with gossip or whatever it might be is only affecting you. Satan uses your sin. His hope is to use your sin not only to destroy you, but to destroy the church. He wants to use you to take everyone else down. He wants Good Shepherd to be petty, small, angry, comfortable, and proud in Jesus' name. He wants us to be horrible and proud at the same time. So that's what what Paul is trying to say to the Colossians and to us is we each need in our prayer life to be watchful over our own souls. Do you know where you're weakest? Do you know the spots in your soul, in your spirit, in your life, in your body that cause you most often to fall into temptation? Do you know what those are? Do you know the conversations you probably shouldn't have and the places you shouldn't be and the thoughts you shouldn't be indulging in? If you don't, you need to be watchful Discover them, offer them up to God in prayer. Seek his protection so that you don't get dragged away and you don't take others with you. Be watchful in prayer for yourself. How many here have a prayer list? Or excuse me, a parish uh, address list, phone list? Anyone? Not many? You should get one. Um, it's out of date. We've got to update it, make it look, make it a little more, to include everyone who's come to us lately. We were, we're not as, um, it's an old one. We need to redo it. But um, use that prayer, that parish um, phone list as a prayer list. Take a page every day. If that's too much, take, take five or six names from that phone list every single day and pray for the people on that list. And tell you what, like in a, after a week, two weeks, a month, you have gone through the entire church, prayed for every single one of your brothers and sisters, prayed for God's blessing in their life, prayed for God's protection in their life. If you know of something that's going on in their life, you can pray for that, that thing there and then. But that will keep you regularly watching over the lives of your brothers and sisters. That's, that, that phone list is a great assistance to us. If you see someone on that list who hasn't been here in a while, you know what you pray for. If you see someone on that list who you don't know whether they're a believer in Jesus Christ or not, pray for their conversion. Watch. If, you know, if you see someone on that list and you know they have a problem with a certain particular sin, pray that they're able to resist and God will protect them from it. To be watchful in prayer is to stand on the walls of your heart and to stand on the battlements of the church and to scan the high places in the valleys. And when you see weakness, temptation, division, rebellion, when you see opposition to the spread of the gospel, you pray because the assumption again in verses 3 and 4 is that God uses prayer to defeat Satan, to spread his kingdom, and to make his people holy and obedient. That's what he does. Okay, now finally, look down at verse, still at verse 2. Paul adds this. Pray steadfastly, you mean keep it up. Uh, be watchful in prayer. And then finally, um, pray with thanksgiving. Being thankful in prayer requires and means observing and recognizing God's grace. Everyone here go like this. <sighs> given the fact that you and I have, well, I'll talk to myself, given the fact that I have sinned against God about 20 times already this morning, I shouldn't be able to do that. What we just did together, that little intake of breath and exhale, um, that means that everyone here is alive, and that is Great, because we all deserve not to be alive. We all deserve to be dead. God has graciously continued to sustain us in life. That's a wonderful thing. But that's just the beginning. He gives you food. He gives you money. 
You may not have as much of it as someone else, but think about what we said about two weeks ago. If you live in the United States of America, you are fabulously wealthy compared to people who live in other places like the village where Anne grew up in Mali. If you are living in the United States and you are alive, you are fabulously wealthy. I don't care what your situation is. You have money, you have shelter, you have clothes, you have food, and you even have at least one person in the world who loves you. That's great. You have fellowship. You have a relationship with other people in the church. Just in the material plane, you have so many wonderful things to be thankful for. But above that, God came himself to live and die in your place and to take away your sins and to uh, make it so that you will never taste death. And then by his grace, he brought you to faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And that means you can go to him whenever you have a need or a desire or want. And he hears you and he promises never, ever to forsake you. Those are all very general things that you, on a daily basis, can give thanks for. Start out thanking God for it. Now, those are all general things, but we can be very specific. As a church, we have a place to worship that's four times the size of our last place. And we have a congregation to worship with that is twice the size it was three years ago. In direct answer, to often unconfident and unbelieving prayer on our part. I've seen in my personal life, and if you think about it, you have seen in your personal life, God's answer to prayer over and over and over and over again. And being thankful in prayer requires you to think about it and identify those things in your life for which you are thankful and that God has done in your life. and in the life of the church. Now, what do you think happens when you do that? What do you think happens when you add this to your regular, steadfast praying every day? What effect does it have? Well, I'll give you just a few. For me, I'm a lot less envious when I spend time thanking God for what I have. I should be dead, Instead, I have a family and a home and a job, and I'm going to heaven when I die, and then one day I'll rise again. Um, when I make a habit of, of seeing that, I'm less prone to look at some other pastor's big church and say to God, why can't I have that? I'm less prone to look at the blessings of other people's lives, and I'm more prone to look at the things that God has given me and be thankful for that and, and content in the life that God has given me. Second, I'm happier seeing my life, even the difficult parts and the parts that have meant pain for me as coming directly from the hand of my Father who loves me, I can find pleasure in what I have and I can find meaning in pain. So I'm just happier when I'm thankful. And finally, and I think this may be what Paul is getting at after he commands steadfastness, um, when I'm more thankful, when I, when I make a point of Thanking God for the blessings in my life, I pray more. Thankfulness remedies my emotional deadness. I may not feel like prayer is accomplishing much, but when I look at what God has actually done through prayer, I'm actually motivated then to pray. I see that it has, in fact, accomplished much. When I look back at my past and remember what I was like, remember what my life was like, I look back on very specific deeds that God has done in my life and circumstances that he's changed that would not have changed otherwise. I recognize that, and that leads me then again to pray. So all these things, the, 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 the first command that Paul gives to be steadfast in prayer is helped by the last command to be steadfast with thankfulness. And that brings us full circle. Steadfastness, watchfulness, and thanksgiving in prayer um, for myself and for the church um, work together. And I'm going to actually stop right now. Where we're going to go um, next week is we're going to take chapter verses 5 and 6, and I'm going to try and get to the goodbyes. I don't know if I'll be able to do that in the, in the rest of chapter 4, but I'm going to try and finish um, Colossians uh, before I leave and I'm hoping to do it next week, and we'll see if that's even possible. Um, the Lord be with you. Let's pray.